So a lot of manuscripts, of course, is what's called a colophon, which is the section at the end where the scribe says, you know, it was the third day of the week of such and such month and mm -hmm. a year, and I wrote this for so-and-so. But most manuscripts, that hasn't survived. And in Torah scrolls, it never existed. Uh, there are actually some exceptions, but that's a different I, story. I have a story about an exception. Ooh, I want to hear that. Okay. So, um, well, there's a bunch of exceptions where the colophon is, is a forgery, but there's actually a mm. bunch of real exceptions. Uh, we mean, it's not a forgery. Um, not when I say a bunch, it's a few dozen maybe that have ever been found. Um, maybe less than that. Um, a uh, lot from Megillat Esther. No, I'm, I'm talking about Taurus. I know, but like with Megilla Esther also, yeah. you know, like a lot okay. of these Italian ones, like these like these um, young women and actually girls that were writing Megilla Esther, mm. like, uh, you know, 200, 300, 400 years ago. Yeah. Some of these Megilla Esther that have been, uh, you know, uh, up for auction in the last several years. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have, they all have colophons. Okay. Um, and some of the um, Sofrot living today also, you know, have colophons attached to their Megillot Oh, just an Esther. Yeah. So tell me about the colophons. The colophon. Okay. Well, the, obviously with Megillot Esther, it's quite common, especially with these young women. Um, there have also been um, like notes left behind. There was a Torah scroll that I checked must have been 15 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't say the community. I don't tend to announce communities because um, mm -hmm. it's their Torah and their business. But um, so I was checking it and I was rolling through and it obviously, you know, was very old and it was made up of a couple of different scrolls and it has sort of been sort of patched together a bit, but very nicely. It was made up of a bunch of scrolls. Well, sometimes if uh, a safer is part of it's damaged and you can't you either will rewrite new and attach to that or you will maybe have different damaged parts that and you amalgamate two other scrolls to get one good usable scroll. I call scroll. that a Franken scroll. Oh, you you have not seen the Franken scroll we have at our house. Um, okay. <laughs> it's literally and, like And uh, I don't mean that in a negative uh, way. Patchwork. No, I, we don't I either. I think Franken scrolls are beautiful because you think you have one scroll and you realize this is actually 10 scrolls. So many different traditions. So I'm going through this Torah and I'm taking yeah. notes and, you know, it needs a little bit of repair, but it's not in too bad a shape because whoever fixed yeah. it last did a very good job. And I get to the end and I go, oh, isn't that interesting? There's an extra chilek I see. So what that means is at the end of the Torah, at the very end, where it ends with the word Yisrael, obviously, mm -hmm. I noticed there was more stitching and extra parchment before we got to the actual wooden roller. And I thought... It's probably just because there hadn't been enough, you know, at the end. Because you really should have more at the end because then so when you roll... Column? What, what are you saying? Well, there's an extra piece. It wasn't just a column. Oh, but, I mean, you need to have more at both ends anyway so that the roller doesn't damage the letters right. at either end. That's just a practical... Right. Um, so um, then I <laughs> then I opened up... I opened it up and I went, oh, and someone had written on this extra piece, Tikanti. I fixed this. Are you serious? I am serious. Very carefully, he wrote, Tikanti, Eliezer Friedman, Pesht, 1947. Wow. It gives me chills. Yeah, and I was so like, he, oh, So he oh. said, I fixed it, so-and-so, and the His year, name is Eliezer and Friedman. And, and I'm thinking, 1947, what software was in Pesht in 1947 fixing Torahs? Like, that has got to me the most incredible story. Wow. <laughs> so so let's start with I'm going to assume he Obviously, was a, he, he wrote was, it all in Hebrew so I'm going to assume he was part of the neolog movement and I don't know anything about I would love to So that that's a I would love to find the largest out who he denomination was. in 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 Hungary it's actually the, one of the oldest denominations um in uh let's say in modern Judaism right I mean it's older than the reform movement if I'm not mistaken um it's it's today it's still the largest denomination in Hungary <laughs> And I'm guessing that in the neologue movement, it's okay to put a colophon. I don't know. I'm, I'm making stuff up because I don't know. You're you don't right. Know. Not, You've got me sitting right here, but you're making stuff wow. up. Wow. No, meaning I'm making it up. <laughs> and that, like, I'm trying to hypothesize. Yeah, why, yeah, yeah. No. Why would this have happened? Yeah. So this isn't some, supposed to happen. Some say that if you do add an extra, you can't write anything on the actual Torah scroll. That mm -hmm. is adding to Torah. That is a massive no-no, as mm -hmm. you know. But if you <coughs> sew an extra piece on and maybe write on the back, then that's not What's adding to back? Torah. Um, I don't remember. It was okay. a really long time ago. Wow. Um, but it was, he did make a point of get, of having extra, 
extra parchment. Again, 1947 in Pesh. Like, where is he getting this beautiful white new parchment? It was it was pristine. Wow. Um, and he got <clears throat> taken the trouble of sewing it on and then writing this. And I just thought, I need to, and I asked the rabbi, I was like, where did you get this scroll from? And he's like, I don't know. So I thought, okay. So I've asked around some of the Hungarian Jews and like <coughs> Hungarian like rabbinical students that I know here in London. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't even know where to begin. But I mean, that. That's crazy. That is going to be a so, really good story. That's that going to be a, a book, story. a movie, a miniseries, a podcast. Um, <laughs> you don't know this man's story. It could be amazing. That is a pretty incredible story. Yeah. So, so the colophons I know about, there's two types. So most of the colophons that are considered authentic are on Karite Torah scrolls. They're mostly in the Furkovich collection in St. Petersburg. A bunch of those are forgeries, but some of them are actually real. Some of them are, are authentic. Um, really? Are they really authentic? <laughs> well, according to uh, um, the scholars who studied them in the 19th century, they're authentic, yeah. Uh, I'm sure the, they know more than I do. There is one that's definitely authentic that is at Trinity College in Cambridge. Yeah. Um, and that's also a Karite scroll. It's not actually a colophon. It's it's a, 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 a vow inscription. Hmm. That, um, the, the guy had something that happened in his life, and he made a vow. If I get through this, I'm going to dedicate a Torah scroll. I'm going to pay for a Torah really? scroll. Really? And then when he gets, finally, he has the Torah scroll written. And at the end, he writes out, you know, this is what happened, and there's 10 sign signatures. Really? Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. So he was like, I made this nadir, and I have fulfilled That's my nadir. Exactly right. Wow. So yeah. 10 signatures. It sounds like yeah. maybe he had like a big bet in there, like a minion. Uh, no, it's kind of like, you know, there were 10 witnesses. And, right. um, you know, in, in um, uh, what was it with uh, Boaz? Wasn't there 10 people in the gate of Bethlehem or something? I don't remember. Anyway, so um, the other example, which is a mystery. Uh, is there's a Torah scroll from Otranto, which is southern Italy, mm. in the early 12th century, which has a colophon with a specific date. Um, as far as we know, there were no Karaites in Italy in the 12th century, mm. so you can't blame it on the Karaites in this case. So somebody <laughs> decided, okay, I can write a colophon in the 12th century. So that already kind of makes sense because... It's so long ago. It was before some of these rules crystallized. I mean, the rules were there, but... Maybe they weren't equally applied everywhere. Right. But in 1947, I mean. Yeah, that's very modern. Come on. We've got books that have been printed that say this is what, yeah. what you have to do and what you can't do.